antenna history. I didn't really know what antenna history was. But um, now the eye is a sort of an antenna, although I suppose we should really call it a sensor because it doesn't transmit as well, unless you're Superman. Um, because, you know, it receives electromagnetic waves, very small ones, you know, right up in the, the spherical nanosphere, whatever. But obviously we can't transmit. An antenna generally receives and transmits. And we've been playing around with this stuff. I mean, what we know now in here we are in 2022 i mean some of us on this zoom call if you actually wrote down what you know and and delivered it into a reasonable paper in the 1830s you would actually win a nobel physics prize <laughs> um because it was around 1830 that faraday used a magnet and uh, some coils and he could sense what was happening on his galvanometer which I don't even know what it is, but that's what it said in the Wikipedia thingy. And with Maxwell's equations, we know that uh, Faraday was, re was reading a time-varying electric field. Then we had a man called Heinrich Hertz in 1861, and he developed a system which forced an electric spark. And he was using a loop to receive that. Uh, wirelessly and in fact I happen to know that Heinz uh, Harold whatever his name was Hurt, Mr Hertz he actually said in his journal that the radio waves that he has discovered he can't imagine will have any use for mankind ever but anyway <laughs> if it wasn't for him of course we wouldn't be here but someone else would have created it of course these people didn't invent this stuff they discovered it and i think that's the magic of, of radio it's always there we just got to discover the physics behind it so fast forward 1901 uh, marconi bought a lot of these patents up didn't he and he used the culmination of that knowledge to transmit across the atlantic they were still unsure about how an antenna really worked how long it should be but in those days of course it was a smart spark transmitter anyway so it was across the whole radio spectrum just like when an old taxi driver comes up past your mansion you can hear the tick 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 across the whole shortwave band However, in 1906, it says here, Columbia University was using a cage of wires for their wireless station. Of course, it was very experimental, and it was n not until 1926, and I can't remember which one was the professor, but there was a Mr. Yagi and a Mr. Mr. Udi, Uda. I think Uda was the professor. And I didn't know that in 1926, the Yagi was effectively invented. But they didn't know the maths yet. Um, 1940s, we had arrays, which is where you would feed more than one antenna at once to get, you know, more signal going that way than that way. And it was in 1967 that the method of moments technique, brackets electromagnetic theory, was introduced by Roger F. Harrington in his 1967 paper entitled and i can't remember what it was called it sounds like there's doorbells going off everywhere it's lovely mm -hmm. now so throughout the history of physics because let's face it as an amateur radio operator you are an amateur scientist okay so um we've managed as scientists whether you're amateur scientists or professional scientists but as scientists we've managed to distill almost everything to a mathematical equation all right so you know <laughs> there is a british youtuber who has twice now he's an old old fellow he owns a shop actually and he he has he said he doesn't agree or he doesn't I'm, i don't want to use invent words but it basically doesn't agree somehow or along those words with antenna modeling but antenna modeling is once you know what the formula is it's a little bit like saying well i can see two beans here and two beans there 
and if I put them together, I can see there's four. But don't you tell me that two plus two is four. I want to see the beans, all right? I mean, that's, that's how ridiculous it is, because it is, there's a bunch of formulas. And how we get to that, if you think about it, you know, you've got two beans plus two beans. You can prove that two plus two is four by getting four beans and going two plus two. It's exactly the same with antenna modelling. We can prove that the formula works by going out into the field and doing some measurements, because that's how science works, isn't it? You have a theory, and then you prove the theory with experimentation. And that wasn't in my notes. So it's because of this method of moments technique, which is a paper to you and me that would look a little bit like Greek wallpaper, all right? that we've been able to model what an antenna does in the real world. Now, every time I look at my camera, I can see an attractive young lady, KJ4VCT, right? Almost smiling at me the whole time, but I don't know what her name is. Melanie. Melanie. So I keep looking at you, Melanie. This, this, <laughs> you're encouraging me with your little smile, Melanie. Well, thank you. Thank you. So this, by uh, coming up with form, we know that our computer works. <laughs> Look at all the doorbells going off. Hang on, did you hear? <clears throat> so it's like we know gravity exists, don't we? And NASA and all the German and uh, American engineers managed to work out. They send a rocket that way at 25,000 feet per second. It will hit the moon and they calculated it all. They calculated it. They modelled it. All right. So just like you can model gravity and have what the moon does, we can model what an antenna does. But it's just important to say that because it's not magic. There's absolutely known formula for calculating how all this stuff works. Hmm. There we are. So the only doubt we have is... Was the programmer putting the formula in right to his little computer? And so that when we come along and put our numbers in, we're getting, you know, rubbish in, rubbish out. Or are we putting our numbers in and we're getting rubbish out? Or are we getting almost right out? But what it does mean is that the average guy or gal or the average Melanie, all right, can model, I mean, quite complex antennas. But let's say just your average Joe or your average Melanie um antenna and how in the main it will behave all right so right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to show you in a nutshell how this stuff works you can probably see i've got four tabs along here okay now the first thing we do i just want you to imagine a really easy antenna let's say you've got two oak trees they're about 30 feet well you can get a line up 30 feet. It's about 10 metres, right? 30 feet. Be, uh, across the two oak trees. So in the geometry tab, you can, if you can think in X, Y, Z, you could do this. Alternatively, we've got a little button. It's called wire edit, which we can press. And let me shut that down so you can, oh, I can see where my sharing is. I can do that. You can see that bit, I'm hoping x y so that's we are now looking down on a as the bumblebee looking at the ground all right x y button and i'm going to put this wire from there to there and then i'm just looking across to see how big this is it says the whole thing is 10 meters that's not quite big enough for what we want which is a 40 meter dipole Let's just say, all right, I'll hit OK. And it says that Y is 10, Y2 is minus 10. So if I go into the View tab, you can see at the moment it's just lying on the ground. And there it is. We can right click that and add a source to the center of that wire. And we can either raise it up off the ground there it says my internet connection is unstable. 
we can either raise it up the, off the ground there or we can go to our calculate tab so that's our geometry tab that's what it looks like and i'm just holding with my mouse and moving around then i go to calculate and i can say things like uh let's have it at, i don't know well you guys probably 7.2 and we'll put it this is in meters so if one meter is about three feet okay let's put it up to about 20 feet which is i don't know, I think about six meters uh this is if you really want to get fussy but we'll make it out of copper white wouldn't make much difference anyway right we could also tell it here so it will remember this is for 7.2 so there's the view it's still sitting on the ground there but on the calculate button we've lifted it up off the ground here with little red dot at the bottom there is actually telling us that we've got wire one center there's a little code for it now in things like easy neck and other things they don't have the drawing program i've noticed so you've got to visualize all this as a as a three-dimensional numbers and type them all into here but anyway whatever calculate we can, we've got a ground set up as well, which you can't see. And it's telling us what the dielectric of the ground, the conductivity and things like that is, which in the main, you just leave as standard. That's fine. Unless you're by the sea or perhaps in a very arid desert, you might want to change those. And then we can just hit the start button. And actually, by a bit of magic, we've got the numbers right. It says our SWR is about 1.34 uh, to 1. And a few other odds and ends and we can hit this far field plot here so if you remember we go to the view tab our take this currents off our <sighs> dipole is north south here so if we go to the far field view we're getting a little bit of extra gain off the sides however not much gain it's actually telling us what the gain is it, it says 6.3 dbi there so if i bring my cursor and hold and come to here it says 2.8 there 2.8 3.8 4.8 5.8 so in fact we're only about 3 db difference at 20 feet left right or north south east west and you can also see that we could hit this button here it's called the far field plot that you can't see so i'm just pulling it in so we can hold on This is the far field plot. So I know if I hold the control button and pull down, we can then move this around. And our 20 feet off the ground, 40 meter dipole would look a bit like this if you could measure it all. All right, obviously it doesn't stop at the edges. It's just showing you at a particular concentration. So that's why I mean, I'll, I'll do a couple of interesting things. We'll raise that up if you like. We'll raise that up and we'll go to 40 feet, which is 12 meters. And just to see what happens at 40 feet, there's not a lot. It's a little bit better east west. And that's why I would say, I'll just temporarily stop sharing a minute. And telemodeling is like a hobby all on its own. It's. <laughs> It's, you know, it's raining for three months of a year. Solid sometimes in the UK. Apart from me, I'm the only mug that's got to get out there and cut wires and develop stuff. But the rest of the time, people are either playing on the radio or, you know, as a hobby itself, you can just muck around with modelling. Because it might not have the exact impedance. It might not have the exact SWR. But in the main, all these software modelling programmes will give you a really good inkling of inkling is that a word in your way in the usa yes. yeah ink. really good idea about what the antenna is kind of probably gonna do right back to sharing again uh with that one uh we go a bit higher if you like so that's 40 feet um now, 8, 17, 18, I think it's 19 metres is 60 feet. See, I'm trying to be bilingual here with my numbers. And then you can start to see that it needs quite a height before you start getting any lobes developing for your longer distance DX. 
Now, one of the things I do is I measure things at five degrees off a horizon. So it says there 175 degrees, the top three lines here. So if I'm interested, genuinely interested in DX, and sometimes I'm not, by the way, sometimes I just like loafing around the UK, that kind of two to 400 mile bubble hop, you know. So for me, you know, I could speak to a guy in Brighton or Manchester or Scotland because 80 metres and 40 metres when we've got the local daytime stuff going on. I'm not really interested in DX. I actually, I'm more interested in, a, in an antenna that works quite low to the ground so my, my signal can go up and come straight back down. So if I have something too high, I might not like that. On the other hand, if it's early in the morning or late at night, I'm trying to remember what 60 feet is, but it's about there, then I'm interested in where my signals are going to go because um, at night time, sometimes, particularly on 40 metres, I might want the USA, which to me is a bit of a hard graph because I've got to get all the way across the Atlantic. And I know my signal's got to be, I don't know, coming off somewhere between five, six, seven, eight degrees off the horizon. So what I do is I, if I model things just for fun, what I'm really interested in doing is I baseline everything at five degrees off the horizon because that's probably my worst case scenario. It's very easy to convince yourself your antenna is going to work really well up here. But it doesn't really matter what I do. I'll always get quite a good, I'll always get, you know, reasonable quality uh, lobe. Uh, up 30 degrees, 30 degrees off the horizon. Anyway, so that's just a little bit of fun on your first, you know, dipole. You might want to say, well, what happens if you inverted V it? Well, there's a little trick. We can right click this and we can divide the wire into, let's say, three pieces, because that way what I'll be able to do is just slide that one to there. And we'll make a little feed point in the middle, you see. And then we'll drop these down like an inverted V. So that will come down roughly about there. Now, I'm not quite sure <laughs> if we'll get a reasonable match. It says 3.4 to 1. When we're modelling, and we're modelling like a vertical or a dipole or a loop, we know from the books and Callum's experiments and your experiments in the past that a vertical will always roughly match to a piece of 50 ohm coax. Your dipole will always roughly match to your 50 ohm coax. And a loop, all the way, you know, a big full wave length loop, you'll get roughly about 200 ohms, so we'll use a 4 to 1 ballon there. And there's the three kind of favourite antennas that people throw up for pennies, OK, in their local apple trees. So let's go back to it again. Oh, I've lost it. That should be there. What wire is it? Wire number two. So we made a mistake. The feed point was down here on this one, not on this one there. So we'll check that again. So I don't think we should have lost anything. Oh, anyway, that's a better SWR. Hundred and oh, five point four again. Minus 5.4. By the way, minus 5.4 sounds really bad, doesn't it? Minus 5.4. So let I'll build another aerial now, or antenna, as we say in America. And I'm going to build just a basic... I'm going to delete these. I'll uh, have zeros in all this. Z2, 10.1. So if I look at this, this is now a vertical. Uh, oh, I've got to unzoom it a bit. That vertical there is about 31 feet. And again, what we could do is we could just type here wire one bottom or base, and that will put a little red dot there. And because it's right on the floor, or it's about to be, it's right on the floor, I'll just check it calculates, it does. Um, the software knows, because it's right on the floor, that uh, it's a ground-mounted vertical. So now we can hit the ground setup, and we can say, and say, oh, I've got, let's say, 32, and this will tell you, this is a quarter-wave uh, radials, 
say we got 32 quarters so 32 30 foot radials give or take well we can have 60 because that's a bit of an ask isn't it 16 you could do okay and we could start the ball rolling again you could see that the gain changed a wee bit there it was at 2.8 now it's 1.28 but that's only for the best gain the best gain is there 153 so that was um 27 degrees off the horizon which for me is great into germany for instance and the netherlands so i've got about i don't know something like 48 if you've got how many states are in the US? Is it 48? Everybody's on Everybody's on mute. 50. 50, is it? Oh, because we got Hawaii and Alaska. Is that the right? It's the two I wasn't forgetting. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. So, um, well, I've got roughly that many countries, you know, within 500,000 miles. So that 20 uh, ish degrees of horizon is lovely on 40 meters for that first quick hop. But what does it look like at 5 degrees off horizon? Minus 5.4. Now, you, sp you speak to all those people that are running verticals and talking to, well, for you guys, it would be, you know, like Cyprus and the Middle East. And, you know, it's literally the other side of the world. Um, so, minus 5.4 sounds really horrible. But in fact, it's OK if it's at five degrees off the horizon because we only need a millionth of our signal getting to the man at the other end. All right. So that's how we build, build a vertical. Interestingly, if we were by the sea, look at this ground setup. We actually are by the sea. Amazing. So in which case that goes up. Your ground conductivity within within a mile or so of the of the sea, your ground conduct conductivity goes to fifty millisiemens per meter. Okay, so now when I start look at the curve, now it gets hugged and sucked down so that at five degrees off horizon, we're now five dB better off, nearly six dB actually. Well, what is six dB? So well, three dB is doubling, and six dB another three dB because you add them together. Is doubling again. So your 100 watt ICOM 7300 is now behaving like another guy's 400 watt radio, you know, uh, uh, 20 miles inland. So that's pretty cool. And that's how you do that. And then I think what we could do, because what I'm here to do, if we think about this, uh, stop and share. This, like all these, because I, I was a member of a club for years, and when somebody comes along to give us a talk, yeah, I want to be inspired, you know. Don't just teach me how to do something, because in the main, if I'm interested, I'll go home and I'll look at it and I'll work it out myself. So I think a good club presentation is a sort of thing where it inspires you. You go, oh, that's quite interesting, isn't it? We'll do a couple others. I discovered a fan vertical. Um, other people discovered it before me, by the way. There's, there's, there's people putting multiple elements off a single feed point, like we just had it on the model, and they would put maybe a wire up against a couple of trees, and they would put like 80 metres here and 40 metres there, and with a bit of paracord and, you know, shock cord and whatever, and they'd have all their elements spread out. But um, it just so happens, I was on holiday right by the coast, with a couple of DX commanders. In the old days, we di I didn't have a brand. It didn't say DX commander. And um, and I just had a 40 meter vertical. And I was just looking at this thing because we were on holiday for two weeks. Just looking at this thing. And I, I, I just thought, what happens if I put another element next to the 40? So I put 20. Now I had a really rubbish match, but I think because I was very close. The elements were very close together. So one's on 40 metres, one's on 20 metres, and I was getting a 3-to-1 match on 20. But I tried it on 20, uh, 15, 10, and 6 for an experiment. No, 20, 10, and 6 as an experiment with slightly wider spacing because I had several bowls with me. We were down there for two weeks. It was like one huge science holiday. Drove Wendy nuts. But... Um, and that did work. So I was, when I came home, I started to develop the idea and I drilled out loads of aluminium plates and stuff and ended up 
with this contraption, if you like, which was a single telescopic pole, with, which was enough just for, not quite actually for 40 metres, uh, with six elements, right? So, and I've modelled it here, and I'll show you that now, just for fun. To give you some inspiration. How about it, Charlie? You happy? Yep, so far so good. Yeah, lovely. Uh, so this here is, we could look at it at the model here. You, you can see that, can we zoom this in a little bit so you can see uh, these little dots here. They're the end of all the different elements you see. And at the base, uh, X, Y, where's the, where is the base? Oh, here we are. I've drawn a hexagonal shape. And it's basically to produce an aluminium plate, hexagonally shaped, with a load of verticals just coming straight up. And that's it. That's it there with all the different elements. You can, if we just zoom in a tiny bit, we might be able to see some of the elements there, look. And the shortest one is going to be, um, for 10 metres, the longest one's going to be for 40 metres. And by the way, my accountant asked me, he said, so why... Uh, why do you have all these different lengths of wires? Uh, Callum? And, I, and it was one of these little sort of epiphany moments, because I've, I don't know about you, but it's really difficult to explain to people what amateur radio is or how an aerial works or an antenna. And, and I said, well, the amateur radio, well, the whole of the HF spectrum, actually, is a bit like an enormous grand piano. So the very long notes, they play the low notes, you see, the long strings, and the very high uh, notes are played by the short strings. So and that's why what we've got here is um, uh, this business of all the different elements. So and the interesting thing is we can, I don't know why it says 3.7, so we could put in at 7.175, there we are. So we can have a look at that. Ta -da. Oh, we're still by the coast, look. Let's do this for your average five, that should say. For your average guy or gal. So 175, it says minus 5.5. And it doesn't matter which band I pick, 14.25, I will always get a similar pattern. Pick another one, uh, let's say 28.4. I don't know where this is tuned for in software anyway. And and it, it looks the same again. It's got very slight imperfection in that circle, but there we are. Apart from, um, can I show you this? 21.45, right at the top, we might get a match. Uh, we don't actually. That is looking a little bit weirder than what we had a minute ago, isn't it? And I'll, I'll, I'll just do that because it's a bit of fun. So we have, one of the reasons the amateur bands were chosen where they were, um, well, the first reason was there were no use to man or beast, so let these amateur scientists, it's back in the 20s, let these amateur scientists play with this stuff, give them these frequencies, but we'll harmonically relate them. So if you're causing a mess on on 7.1 your second harmonic which is going to be the biggest load of crap that you're producing is going to be on 14.2 but it just so happens a loop resonates this is a full wavelength loop will resonate on every harmonic so you'll get 7.1 14.2 23.3 and 28.4 a dipole and a vertical will resonate on every other Okay, so if you've got a 7.1 or 7.2 megahertz, it won't resonate on 14.4. The next time it's resonate, actually, it is on the 21 meter band, uh, 15 meter band, because it's every other harmonic. It's every odd multiple. So three sevens are 21. That's we get a tune there. Now, that's what the textbooks tell us. What actually happens because we've got things like height above ground and a few other variables going on. Um, 
it's normally a little bit higher than that. So if I've got an antenna at 7.1, the chances are it's not going to be resonant on 21.3. It's going to be another couple of hundred kilohertz, actually, and that's what I found with the 40-meter antenna. Um, I'm debating whether to tell you another story, but I'll hold that back. To cut a long story short, what I've done to get 40 and 15 to work on the same element is I go up not the full 31 foot whatever it is I go up about I think it's 29 feet and I come back down a nearly six feet that gives me a perfect tune on 40 but it also changes where the harmonic is on the 21 meter band uh, 21 megahertz band and instead of being 21.5 even 21.6 it brings it down to 21, a more manageable 21.2, right in the middle of the band. In fact, I've noticed you can adjust that second harmonic with the length of this foldover. In a nutshell, that is it. But how does it perform? Because if you go on Eham and QR's head forums, which, by the way, I don't attend to, right? Because I don't want an argument every day. Um, they'll tell you that a three-quarter wave vertical is effectively a sky warmer. Right, so let's share this and we'll have a look at that. So, is it a sky warmer? Well, the reason that they think it's a sky warmer is that in all the models it will show you, because this is for 21 mega, uh, 15 meter band, we're getting our highest gain up here at, uh, it looks about 45, 50 degrees, 60 degrees, doesn't it? But then if we baseline back down to five degrees and find out what's going on, and bear in mind we've got an average ground setup of 16 radials, which is, let's face it, for your average guy is quite a lot of radials. We're getting minus 3.4. So if you remember the last time we did this, we were getting about minus 5.5. So in fact, we're about 2 dB better off on the long haul um, on a three-quarter wave than we're getting on anything else. And if you've ever heard me on 15 metres in the last month live streaming, that'll be a three-quarter wave. And over skies in the US and all sorts of stuff. So has that given... What's the time? 42. Has that given you a little bit of inspiration? Guys, you can come off mute if you like and ask some questions and whatever else. Okay, anybody having any questions? Go ahead now, shoot. Well, um, thank you very much, Callum, for your presentation. I've enjoyed it. I'm Joe, by the way, the one with the podcast. Joe, praise, brother. Um, now, I presume that this program is available and can be used. Can one find it online? Does one have to purchase it, or is it in the open software? So it's completely or? free, and I will send Charlie... Uh, sometime tomorrow, a link of how you can get hold of it. Uh, it's it's a part of the hobby, I think, which is... Uh, it comes with a lot of stock antennas as well, right? Which I am going to fire up. You know, two-element beam for 20 metres, all sorts of stuff. And you can play with things like, like a hex beam, for instance. Now, it doesn't have a hex beam in the model. I don't know if anybody's built one, but we know that a hex beam operates quite well um almost as a two element yagi loaded yagi right it's that sort of performance so it just so happens that in the model is a two element loaded yagi for you know in the stock software for for 20 meters so you can play with the height you can go well, at what point does it just beat in one direction only a standard vertical in other words because come on if you've got a little apple tree in your backyard somewhere you put, I think it's 4.9 metres, whatever that is in feet, up your apple tree, you know, and just hold it with a bit of shock cord or something and a brick at the bottom and scatter a few radials out, where, hey, you've now got a DX antenna. At what point would a hex beam beat it? It's about 40 feet that it, the, the trade-off goes, oh, I think hex beam's going to be better, you know. But by the way, it's only going to be better in one direction. Or as somebody once said to me, like, oh, yes, a vertical, equally bad in all directions. I'd actually say, well, I mean, I've been using a vertical for a long time. I would say a vertical is equally good in all directions. It can be beaten, but you've got to be 
have the right gear and the right bearing, you know. By the way, I'm not a vertical nut, right? But a lot of us, particularly in the UK, were restricted on space. And Rudy Sevens did a lovely article. He's one of your guys. November 7th. Forget his call sign. He took all his quarter wave radials and he cut them in half. But he put each one back into the system again. He connect, physically connected up and there was imperceptible difference. So you, you don't need quarter of wave radials. You can go down eighth of a wave. So you can have 32 eighth of a wave is the same as 16 quarter waves. There we are. That's all for free, Charlie. I haven't charged anybody for that. <laughs> <laughs> so basically the radials, if you don't have... Go ahead, I'll... Ellen. I was asking, is there a manual or instructions with it? Uh, no, I had to fumble my way. So I went on YouTube and, I, I, and in the end, I mean, there's some really bad videos of mine going back 10 years, but... Over the last two years, I've, if you just do a search for MMANA tutorial on YouTube, I've done some simple to follow stuff that will do all this. Right through loading coils and the all sorts thing, of stuff. The other thing is when I've been on HF, I've heard a couple of people talking about your antennas and they were very, very pleased with them. Nice. Question. Yeah. Um, how does the? Uh, oh, let me get my speaker down here. Is that I John? have a. Yeah. I, yes, it is. Thank you for being here. By the way, you've, you've, you've. I like, I like your dress and the way you've been lying yes, in that field yeah, all night. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very patient. <laughs> you are. Yeah. And you don't want to see my face. It's too ugly. No. I obviously. Yeah. And uh, well, I won't make any more comments. I no. could make some other comments and not mix mix company. <laughs> um. I have a B squared terminated folded dipole that's up 45 feet. Yes. Each end is at about 15 feet off the ground. Yeah. I'm wondering how that modeling tool would handle that. What it would give I you, it would give you a, it might not give you a, a, a cock on impedance match, but it would certainly give you a far field plot. Ah, okay. Because there are modules inside a box that. Uh, that particular antenna does not require a tuner. I, I use it for Mars okay. for that reason. Yeah. Uh, uh, and um, but I recently just put an FT one thousand onto that antenna, which has a built-in tuner. It makes yeah. all the difference in the world. Yeah. And plus, it's a good radio. It's an old good radio. Lovely. Yeah. Two but VFOs. I was curious, as well. What's that? Two VFOs as well. Yeah. And it it uh, really is. You know, guys that I was hearing on 4 Meg up in Kentucky on my, as I had a 718, it was my uncle's radio. Mm. I'd be, hang on a second. I'd be weak readable yeah. on this AT, FT1000 when I tune it. It's like uh, loud and clear. And I'm wondering, um, you know, I know the tune is part of it, but I'm wondering about this modeling tool, how I can confirm with whatever radio I'm using, uh, even with those modules, how that uh, um, gain might um, be, how I might be able to model that and make sense of it. Yeah. I'm, I'm just going to change topic, but stay with you on that one, John, is that so for the last couple of months, I've put two receive antennas down. One is one of these... Uh, they call it loop on ground, loop on the ground. So it's 15 feet square. It's a little transformer. I can't remember the spec. And some cheap coax back to my shack. And that received, I was amazed. Um, well, the, the signal to noise ratio, the signal went right down, but the noise did, nearly disappeared. You just got to turn the knob, uh, put the preamp on and turn the volume up and you, I can hear them. Uh, and the other one I've been very impressed with is a 90 meter, three nines, 27, about 300 feet all the, way, all the way around my antenna field, one foot off the ground. I'm hearing DX on that. I'm hearing DX on the little one as well, because even the 1000 MP, um, it's, it's receiver's great, right? The thing is, right, I mean... Uh, where you know i could write a book i'm not going to but since well 
since the Yagi was invented and people started investing in Yagis, it's a fantastic receive antenna. It really is. But most of the other antennas we use aren't that brilliant at receive, really. But we've got used to the fact that we use this one antenna for receive and transmit. However, most radios built over the last 20 or 30 years, if you look at the back, might be a little phono jack or BNC or something, and it'll say RX. There's a little button on the front of your radio for receive. And, um, and you can swap between your transmit and your receive. If you've never done it, I recommend you do it. It blew my mind away. What I do is I, uh, for particularly uh, someone like you, John, who have got a two VFO radio, you can, um, you can sync the second VFO up with your first. So as you, as you turn, they'll both go together. The knob doesn't actually move, does it? But the digits, display, the, the display changes. So you can hit the tracking button. And then in one ear, you can separate in stereo. In one ear, you've got your receive. And one ear, you've got your transmit um, antenna. And you can, you can, it almost starts to go sort of spatial. You know, it's, it's a one, particularly if one is vertical and one is horizontal, you get this fantastic stereophonic image as the polarization changes. And if you've ever run a special event station and, and ended up with a pileup and you use a system like that, actually they line up inside your head along here. You can hear, you know, one guy here and then there's a guy in Pennsylvania there and, and you have a, a guy in Florida here. They'll... They're all different a bit because everybody's got some slightly different polarization. It's the most marvelous experience I can. Uh, and I've, I've only just started doing this. I'm absolutely blown away. It's like a new uh, dimension to my hobby because I do a lot of pileups because I quite like doing that. And uh, to have a whole um, theater of call signs, not just in a block, but they separate out. And you, I can, you know, what our brains are like. They're quite good aren't they you can almost look at the call sign and go oh there's a guy over here he's really strong and you can focus on there uh, but to answer your question john i don't know most stuff can be modeled there is a yahoo or a groups io you know there's one of these groups and you could ask questions and people come up with the answers i think in the in the meantime if you're interested draw <coughs> yourself a dipole draw a vertical get a loop going get the basics so you know where the, the buttons are and then you can get a bit more creative Anybody right, else? We have, yeah, we have any other questions? I'm, I'm certainly going to go have a look at your. You got you got some YouTube um, um, videos that are now current. Yes, about eight hundred of them, Joe. <laughs> well, that'll provide some good entertainment. I'm Mate, I there. some of my you you sh I do try to be fairly lighthearted. Yeah, I Just think do like I did. Do like I did, Joe, and subscribe to his channel, then you won't miss him. <laughs> 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 I've become, uh, I'm a twice weekly show, Joe. You will soon be, uh, you'll soon be a regular, I can tell from your I'm, excited, I'm, I'm hilarious I'm laughing. Yeah, I'm definitely interested. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah, guys, and if you want a, uh, a link to his YouTube channel, it is uh, in the event uh, on yeah. our homepage. You click on events. And I have the YouTube link there. It is in the email that I sent out for today tonight's yeah. meeting. And currently it's still also on our home page so uh but that well, just search for dx commander well, there can that, only be yes. one eric wants in yep Ooh. he's in have you let him in yep he's already in okay it says admit him here oh there he is eric oh look he's doing a presentation there and that's still shot <laughs> <laughs> so how big is the club charlie uh, we have currently around 80, uh, 80 yeah. members. Lovely. And do you do special events, field days, things like that? We're Yes, we're actually uh, going to be a uh, winter field day. Yeah. We're going to be at a park called Quiet Waters Park. We used to be there every year, but because of the sea uh, virus. Yeah. yeah. Um, the C it's, word. Yeah. <laughs> it's, this, it's this weekend, so we're, we're gearing up right now. Yeah, yeah. So, Great. Yeah. So we're meeting this year the first time again after a um, year, almost, yeah, two years actually, two years. Yeah. So Tremendous. it's going to be fun. It's going to be cold too. We're going to go down to uh, 40. I heard something. 30, 38. 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. 30. Okay. 
So it's just I about freezing. South for the winter. Yeah. For for you, that's that's normal temperature during the winter, probably. Uh, I remember uh, even the summers in England. I had a, um, my aunt lived in England, uh, and I used to go when I was in school. I used to visit her every summer. Right. So even during the summer, the temperatures were not that too hot. hot. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. to answer your question, we do a lot of events that involve the consumption of food. Uh, <laughs> I I, yeah. I would do very well at your place, especially every Mondays. Well, <laughs> join us. Come over anytime and join us for a field day. Ah, lovely. Okay, Charlie, you can hit the um, uh, the stop recording button in a moment, or or now, because uh, I just need the the file so I can bolt in the um, parallel edit the um, the screenshot. But I'd okay, like to say, me... Gold Coast boys and girls, may the force be with you. Thanks for having me tonight. It's been a pleasure. And uh, applause, applause, applause. I'll, I'll see you on much. see you on YouTube at the X Commander. I just right. downloaded it. Looks good. Brilliant. Cheers, good luck to you. Adios, amigos. I'm off then. All right. Adios. Bye, bye, everybody. Have a good Take sleep. Care, bye, bye. Thanks, guys. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.